Welcome. Today we're having a COVID-19 forum organized by State Representative Kathy Lenatra with an emphasis on mental health amid the pandemic. You can watch this forum in our viewing area on government and public channels or on PACTV's live streaming channel, Prime, which you can view at pactv.org slash live. For questions during this forum, please email them to questions at pactv.org. For replay times, visit pactv.org slash regional. Kathy will introduce her special guests for today's forum. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be back here again for our second Friday. Um, so excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today. I have two wonderful guests. I have Jen Murray, who is a friend actually from Kingston, and she's the school adjustment counselor at West Elementary in Plymouth. And I have Kelly Stever, who works at uh, Mellow Mindset in Plymouth and psychotherapist, Kelly? Yes. Yes. So thank you both for being here. I'm really excited about our discussion we're gonna to have today. And I'm sure there's gonna to be tons of questions. And as I did last week, I'll think of many for myself and my personal experience being working at home with two kids with school and a husband and all that. But I'm gonna introduce Jen. So Jennifer Murray is a licensed school adjustment counselor who has worked with students across all grade levels. Currently, she works for Plymouth Public Schools at West Elementary. Jen holds a Master's of Counseling degree from Bridgewater State University and a Master's of Education from Boston University and offers years of experience as a clinical therapist to her role in the school setting. She has additional training in areas of trauma, informed care and substance use. Working with students from kindergarten to college age, Jen is able to see the changes unique to each stage of learning and development development and work with students on making successful transitions. Jen, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to participate. It's such a great honor um, and a great opportunity to provide some information to the community where we have so much going on around us. Um, so bear with me because speaking in this format is not something that I'm used to, but I will do my best and look forward to the question and answers piece too to, to capture anything that I might have missed. Um, when I was asked to participate on this panel, I started brainstorming the, the key points that I wanted to touch on. I, and then quickly I became pretty overwhelmed. I mean, there are just so many layers to what we are all facing right now. I needed to stop and walk away and, and take a deep breath. And then it came to me. And that was my, my biggest takeaway for everyone listening today, that it's okay to stop when you're feeling overwhelmed and when you need to, to take breaks, to practice breathing and mindfulness exercises, and try and just focus on only what's in front of you in that moment. When you are ready, check out the resources that the teachers, counselors, the providers are sending and posting and sharing, and browse through the links that we'll provide today through Kathy's website. When you're ready, take a deep breath and then log in to your child's Google Classroom or whatever program that your educators are utilizing. And when you feel overwhelmed and frustrated or confused, reach out to us. When your child needs extra support or would just like to feel connected to a familiar person, reach out to us. We really are here to help. We encourage your emails. We check our messenger features regularly. And we want to support you and your families as best we can from the school systems. In the past few weeks, I've been hearing from families and colleagues that there seems to be several areas <coughs> of consistent concern or challenge. And I thought it would be helpful to address those. And I, I kind of broke them down into five areas. Uh, schedules and routines. These days, remembering what day of the week it is can be pretty hard. Connection. Trying to stay connected to others during social distancing is quite a challenge. So discussing difficult topics with your children, especially when you're looking for answers that, that we don't have yet to give. And then mental health with specific, you know, specifically addressing anxiety and depression. And then grief and loss, um, but more so today on the grief and loss of those special moments and those milestones that everyone's been looking forward to. The loss of not being able to see grandparents or extended family, the loss of participating in spring sports, sorry. Um, in dance recitals or, or just the loss of life as we had known it for a little bit. Uh, Kathy's forum next week will have 
grief and loss specialists coming on to, to talk about bigger concerns in that area, which is a great resource. I'm looking forward to next week diving into that a little bit further. Um, so first for schedule, for my elementary level caregivers, I'm hearing that you are having a hard time figuring out the schedule and how to make it all balanced. And from households with older students, I'm hearing and admittedly experiencing <laughs> that mornings have a much later start than they did when school began at 720. So trying to balance the Google Meets and Zoom calls for everyone's classes at all grade levels is a challenge itself. I can relate to how hard it is to remember who has to log in at 10 a.m. on Monday, who has one at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. So additionally, we have new situations in our homes where parents may be essential and they're having to go out of the home for work. Older students may be called on to be caretakers for younger siblings. Many of our high school students are actively working and filling shifts at local grocery stores and food, food service establishments. <clears throat> there may be one computer at home for multiple children to access, or one that you need for work yourself. So trying to conduct school from home during eight to two is for most families, not very realistic. So let's break it down a little. My advice is to look for the natural rhythm of your household. It's been a few weeks now, and some of us have gotten into a sort of pattern. If your students are sleeping in a little bit, plan for that. Let them get the sleep they need to grow and let their brains develop. If your household is full of early risers and morning people, admittedly a very foreign concept to me, but if they are, embrace it. One of the luxuries we have for being home right now is making the schedule around what works best for us. What are those natural rhythms? So most school districts are assigning work at the beginning of the week and having it be due by the end of the week. This allows students to break up the workload in ways that work best for them. If your student doesn't want to do their reading during the day and can't focus, try reintroducing it through a bedtime story. If they wake up on Monday and they're all about math, make Monday a math Monday. For older students, this is a great life lesson as they learn to prioritize Make a plan and learn how to manage their time. In addition to academics, our students are receiving virtual lessons for dance classes, coaches with workouts, materials for religious ed classes, online scouting meetings, et cetera. It, the list really just goes on and on. And suddenly, we as parents are expected to facilitate everything. And it's completely overwhelming. I'm going to go back to my opening comments of take a break and take a breath. When you are ready, add into the schedule what you can. It's not a race and nobody is expecting perfection. You are doing a great job and allow yourself to take a minute and recognize that and congratulate the other parents around you as well because we are all in this together and we can all use a well-deserved positive boost for sure. Connections. Connections, this is a big one. Whether your student is an introvert or an extrovert, the feeling of connection is really important to us all. And being isolated from social circles is particularly difficult for youth. Yeah, they have social media, but it's so much more than that. I recently asked my son, a high school freshman, if he wanted me to pick him up something from what we now call the outside world. He said, no, I don't miss things. I miss people. And today I'm just sad about it, right? That summed it up pretty well. Some days we are okay, and then other days it just hits us and we are completely sad about it. And no shamrock shake is gonna fix it. Just last night, I read an article on social versus physical distancing. And, and it made me think, like, have you been to the grocery store lately? Have you noticed the lack of eye contact we give to each other or the non-existence of pleasantries? Being socially distant is referring to the physical distancing we are practicing in our communities. The six foot, <clears throat> six foot rule and continuing to nurture social relationships is key to maintaining our well-being. Um, help your students feel in control of healthy connections. Encourage them and remind yourself to not let coronavirus be the headliner of every conversation. Write a letter, old school, I know. Um, make a thank you card for a community helper or send a note to a resident at a local senior center. Go online and find out what your local library offers. 
we just found out that the Kingston Public Library has a seeds library that they just started this year. You can contact them, they'll mail you seeds right to your house and then you can start your garden. It's pretty cool. Take a virtual field trip, connect the world around you, make a phone call, talk to somebody, take part in a birthday parade, write chalk messages on your sidewalk, get creative. And if the, visual, the virtual world is your preference or their preference, Set up a Google Meet with friends or make a virtual lunch bunch. These online tools that we're using for our classrooms and our communications through the schools aren't just for us. You can utilize those if that works for your household and maintain some communication too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Difficult discussions are kind of my third quick topic, um, but they are always uncomfortable and they are rarely easy. What's important here is to validate your students' feelings they absorb far more than we realize most of the time. Let them share their worries. You do not need to have all the answers. You do not need to offer a fix or a solution, especially when we might not have one. Offer comfort and love and let them know that you are always there to listen and build a trusting relationship so that they will know far into the future that you are their go-to person. Give honest answers when you can and keep them age appropriate. With much more time on our hands and an increased access to media, our students have the ability to hear and see stories of, on all kinds of topics. They're hearing conversations and worries that happen at home or with their friends. And just like we do, we can feel overwhelmed by the bigger picture, our kids can too. So let them ask their questions, offer guidance, support, and a listening ear, give them an honest answer when you have one and given I don't know right now when that's the truth. Let them learn that you are with them through the big and small worries. Let them know that you are honest and to be trusted. Let them feel comfort, comforted, validated, and loved. When the world returns to our new normal, this is what they will remember the most. Several resources to help with these discussions are going to be included on Kathy Lenatra's website. Um, so I hope that you can check out those. There are some activities and articles that are related um, going forward. To talk quickly about anxiety, depression, and mental health. Um, it's fair to say that there's been an increase in anxiety and depression for children and adults alike. The uncertainty about so many things in our world can only exacerbate these feelings. And the physical and emotional toll of social distancing over time results in a worsening of mental health concerns. For children, it's hard for them to articulate what they're feeling, and we may see anxiety surface in a variety of behaviors, from acting out to withdrawing, all around different behaviors that might seem out of the norm that are really coming from this internalized anxiety. Worrying about the what ifs and dwelling on how bad things could easily spiral into overwhelming is, becomes panic and dread. If you listen to yourself and how you are feeling, Stay informed, but set boundaries for yourself. Ooh, something I need to work on too. But limit how often you check for updates. Use trusted news sources for information and take a breath, take a break when you are feeling it becoming too much. Children are expressing increased fear and worry about getting sick and about loved ones getting sick. Help them focus on what they can control. Empower them in the action of choosing to stay home as much as possible as that is an action that they can participate in to help keep everyone safe. Wash your hands, avoid social gatherings, and getting plenty of sleep are all actions that we are taking to help maintain all of our safety. Reach out to supports and providers. Listen to your children's comments and complaints and concerns, and watch for changes that may signify greater difficulties. Changes in mood, appearance, sleep, and eating, and for some of those, I know it's extra challenging right now to notice those changes. My second grader at home loves that most school days are now pajama days. But kind of keep, keep a tab on where they're at. And, and if anything feels off, don't be afraid to ask them about it and follow up about that. And there's lots of area providers that are quickly available to help should you need to sound out any questions or concerns. Grief and loss, so I touched on this quickly in the beginning, and grief and loss will be covered next week, which I'm grateful for, and a little bit more in depth over the loss of somebody that is close to you that may have passed. 
And for here and for today's purposes, I'm really focusing on the disappointment of those missed moments. As parents, it's really hard to let go of longing to see your child walk across the stage to get their diploma, to grieve for the student athlete who has been training for months to prepare for the spring season, and for not having that birthday party as planned, for all of the end of the year events and milestones, the step up days, so much is changing. In addition, so much is changing within our homes and our families, the expectations and the roles within our family. And there might be some grief for that. Some children are becoming a little bit more parentified and have a little bit more responsibility on their plate. Some are facing bigger challenges and by default growing up a little bit quicker. So it comes back to feeling that connection and being okay and okay to say, I am sad that something's not happening or I am disappointed and just being validated in those feelings. I do, I come from Plymouth Public Schools, so I have to give a shout out um, but Plymouth Public Schools has been working very hard on so many ways to celebrate our students and bring them together and foster that connection and honor the grief that we're feeling about those missing moments that are so special. Plymouth North was hosting Thursday Night Lights and Plymouth South is having a drive through parade to help students connect. And there's just so many creative ways our school districts are pulling together for our communities. Our graduating seniors, our fifth graders getting ready to transition to middle school, our preschoolers who are so excited for kindergarten. We are so very proud of each and every one of you. So quickly, some things that you can do. Be a calming influence, even if you don't feel calm on the inside. Be a calming influence to your children and your students. Use your supports. Reach out to teachers and counselors and community providers. Again, we are very much here for you. Find an app that has breathing exercises or mindfulness activities that works for you. I personally like calm.com, but other people like other things. So find something that is relevant for you. A calendar. Find some fun items to add back onto your calendar, things that will look forward to. It's been hard on all of us to cross out vacations and recitals and graduations. So work on special days or moments that you can look forward to, like a living room concert special or a family game night. I just learned that May 10th is National Clean Up Your Room Day. Ooh. So my teenagers are really going to love that one, right? I'm circling that calendar date, that's for sure. Amazing. May 10th, moms and dads. May 10th. It's the high excitement here in the Mari household. Um, but also, and more importantly, May 15th, National Chocolate Chip Day. Um, our students are living through a, histor a significant historical moment. And so this one we kind of liked, we were brainstorming other ideas as my kids like to think about how, how they are experiencing history. And so a lot of the area elementary schools do a living history museum project. And so have your student think about whatever grade level, how they would like to be portrayed at their grandchild's fourth grade living history museum and then take that into account of how they're approaching things now and what they want their takeaways to be. Find ways to help in your community, practice self-care both individually and as a family, and then take time to check in with each other every day to see where you're at. And ultimately, take a break and take a breath. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Jen, I was gonna call you <laughs> Julie because I was gonna throw it to Julie. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. That was really so much information, Kelly. So you did refer to um, Kathy's website. So I'd just like to bring it up so people can see. If you go to the main thank web, you, that'd be great. Yep. If you go to the main website, if I'm correct, Kathy, if you if you click on the COVID nineteen, yes, and you let that open up, it's going to go down to um, a whole bunch of things that you talk about. But right in the middle of the screen, you have mental health resources. And this is where you're going to be putting all the resources. Is that true for, for that all your... That is true and correct. We will get those up today for everyone. Great. Okay, perfect. Then I will go back to you and you can introduce Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Well, we just had Jennifer, so now we're going to have Kelly. I mean, Kelly, I'm Jen, sorry, that Kelly. that was excellent. Whew, I'm crazy. I say, um, it, is, it is hard if you're a parent that's a perfectionist. And you really thought, like, when we went into this, I thought to myself, you know what? We're all going to learn a foreign language together, or we're all going to do this together. And 
you know, weeks go by and uh, my kids are sleeping until 1030 and it's, it gets a little frustrating as a parent when you have, you think you're going to do all these great things and they don't happen. Um, my youngest heard me saying one night, I'm like, I feel like I failed as a parent because they haven't learned a new skill during this, but thank you for that. Cause that made me feel better. And I'm sure it made a lot of others feel better. So Thanks. thanks, but I'm going to go to Kelly Stever. So Kelly Stever is a licensed mental health counselor and the owner of the private practice Mellow Mindset. It's situated in downtown Plymouth, where she helps individuals, couples, and groups improve their relationships through talk therapy, as well as compassion-based practices such as mindfulness, meditation, and yoga. Prior to opening her practice, Kelly spent nine years in community counseling working on the front lines of the opioid epidemic and supporting individuals affected by trauma pursue healing and social justice. During the COVID-19 crisis, Kelly is working with partners in health to conduct community tracing, providing free counseling to intensive care restaurant restaurants, I'm sorry, residents at Mass General Hospital through the Emotional PPE Project, and will soon begin training with the American Red Cross to serve as a disaster mental health volunteer. Kelly is proud to call Kingston her home, as do I and Jen, where she lives with her husband, three children, and a Springer Doodle, which I've never seen a Springer Doodle, Lila, who is a frequent co-therapist in telehealth sessions. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. I know that we, you know, we're worried about our kids, but I have to say it's trying on a relationship, um, whether you're married or you, you live with someone. Um, especially when you have different ideals on what should be happening now and different expectations. Um, but I'm sure you have a lot to share with us. So thank you and welcome. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm gonna try to do my best. Um, so you're absolutely right. I think that uh, there's so much emphasis right now on our children, which is so important because clearly they're, they're the most vulnerable and they're absolutely um, doing an amazing job adapting to these circumstances, and we really want to support them and nurture them and mitigate any of the, the harmful effects. So it's easy, I think, as parents to spend all of our time really focusing and worrying um, about our children and then add in any concerns that you might have about working from home or financial pressures if you've lost your job. Those feel very urgent and present. And it can be easy to take for granted your, your partner um, and think, you know, they're all set. Uh, we're just going to work side by side and we're going to we're going to tackle this thing and forget to to nurture that that connection um, and really to, to take time to invest in taking care of one another. Um, so I'm going to talk about the family system as a whole, and I know that there's a lot of information out there, and we've all heard a lot of the same things over and over, which are important things. Um, and I'm going to echo some of the things that Jen said. Uh, I really appreciated all of her thoughts, um, and and some things, you know, in particular that I think are just really important for us all to remember, even if it is repetitive. Um, so obviously this pandemic, it's a threat not just to our physical health, but to our mental and our emotional health. Um, and, you know, that's not surprising when we know that the, the mind and the body are connected, um, that there's this complex interrelationship that's happening and our thoughts and our feelings really affect our physical health and vice versa. So people are in all sorts of different, different situations, as we've pointed out. Um, and for some people, this is traumatic. So they are living through trauma right now, whether they themselves um, are ill or a loved one is ill or has passed away, or if they are a first responder or a medical professional and they're witnessing firsthand the devastating effects of this illness. Other people are grieving the loss of jobs, routines, structures, security. Um, and at a minimum, we are all witnessing the destabilization of systems that we've come to rely on and I think all took for granted, you know, to see a pause in our, our educational systems and workplace and um, the effects on our economy, I think is throwing us all for a loop. So it, it's hard, it's almost surreal that, that this is happening. And I'm hoping that a lot of people are 
feeling a sense of, of um, attenuation or, or return to normalcy in, in some ways that the, the initial sort of um, terror of, of witnessing this might, might be something that we're starting to um, become a little bit more accustomed to and, and trying to sort of pivot and adapt. Um, but everybody is in different places right now, and that's okay. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to feel at this time. Um, so we can agree that it's a very difficult time. Everyone's experience is unique. Um, that said, we're all experiencing a heightened level of stress. And we know quite a lot about stress, especially as therapists. So we know that stress, you know, is something that can be healthy. It's a normal part of life. So it can motivate you to go after promotion or ask someone out on a date. It can intensify feelings of closeness and unity and intimacy. Um, but it can also have real negative effects. Um, the kind of stress that we're living through right now um, is the one where there is an invisible threat. So it's hard because typically our bodies respond to stress in such a way so as to prepare us to uh, deal with the threat. So we all know a little bit about fight, flight, or freeze probably at this point. Um, so we know that the stress response triggers a cascade of hormones that elevates our heart rate or blood pressure. We are um, being readied to, to run away from, from a lion, if we're thinking in evolutionary terms of how this developed in our brain. Um, a perceived threat or an imagined threat is more difficult. So obviously this is, this is a real threat, but there's a lot we still don't know about this virus. And so we're all hyper vigilant. We're in that threat state and we're scanning our environment and trying to know what this enemy looks like, how it behaves and what we should do in response. There's a lot of information out there and a lot of it is conflicting. So it can be really tempting to feel like it's a survival strategy for me to be ingesting a lot of news. And at the same time, that can keep our stress response um, stuck in that on position where we are constantly feeling as if the threat is present and imminent and urgent. And that causes extreme wear and tear on the body, and you can imagine that is not good for our relationships as well. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the family system. So the family system is an intensely connected group of individuals, even more so under these circumstances where we are all cooped up. So normally if one individual in a household is experiencing a stress response, that will affect the other members of the household but it will also be dispersed among the other groups that they're associated with. Um, so that might include someone's workplace or the school system or neighbors, friends and family, where people can seek uh, comfort, where they can release some of the tension. And so everything's kind of diluted. Now we're seeing everybody cooped up in the house. So we need to first and foremost, be really mindful of our own experiences. Um, be, be careful observers of what's going on in our mind and bodies. Are we preoccupied with an anxious thought? Um, are we experiencing physical symptoms that tell us that anxiety is um, at a dangerous level in our body? Headaches, um, sleep disturbances, appetite changes. And some of that is normal to a degree. Um, but I think that we wanna watch out, just like Jen said, for when that becomes um, problematic. So we're all experiencing the stress, we're all cooped up, and we are all interrelated in that whatever one person in the household does, it affects everybody else. And therapists often look to Bowen family theory, family systems theory, to help us understand the different ways that family members will try to cope with crisis anxiety. Um, and one of the ways is there's a there's a whole there's eight, um, but one is triangulation, um, and that can be something as simple as you know 
dad says no to more Xbox time and the teen goes to mom to get permission. So really kind of complicating and maneuvering around boundaries using um, a third person. So that's just one example of ways that we try to deal with a problem in a family system um, in a way that, that causes more problems. And when we're aware of that, we can take steps to try to identify whose problem is this, what role am I playing in this, this triangulation, you know, how do I, how do I um, effectively serve the family system and not contribute to, to um, a dysfunctional way of handling this problem. Um, and this is, this can give way to mental mental health problems, but this is not a mental health problem per se. This is just a human problem. This is a family um, and not even so much a, a problem, but a, just a, a process that every family experiences. So other ways that people try to um, cope with anxiety and anxiety in a family is to overfunction or underfunction. So when somebody is experiencing a lot of anxiety, um, so say the teen in the household is experiencing a lot of anxiety, mom might go into overdrive and try to micromanage. And like Jen talked about, try to, try to you know, side by side, do the homework and create the routine and schedule and exercise, all these things. And it's a reciprocal relationship where the other person on the other end of that process might under function, might give up responsibility, might uh, disengage, stop taking responsibility for their goals, stop making decisions. Um, and, and it can appear that they're just being lazy or they don't care, they're being difficult. Um, but in fact, these are all stress reactions. These are all a way of trying to cope with the anxiety and maintain homeostasis within the family. So the big one that I am going to focus on is conflict, um, because conflict can um, be particularly difficult to manage in a household, especially again, where um, we don't have the outlets that we normally do. Um, so conflict, um, one of the things that I want to point out about, about conflict is just as all behavior is information, conflict is actually really valuable information. When there's conflict, there's something going on in the inner worlds of each party that is significant. And the important or the, the best way we can kind of respond to conflict is to understand that you can't manage the other person's reaction, but you can manage your own. So staying calm, uh, using a calm voice, you know, we use the analogy of tug of war, dropping the rope. You know, if, if you're not engaging in a power struggle, there is no power struggle. When one half of the equation changes the way that they're, they're acting, it fundamentally changes the dynamic in the relationship. Um, so tapping into your own ability to, to disengage from the conflict and remain calm and um, a force for de-escalation. Uh, the other thing is to get curious, you know, what, what fear is this triggering um, in the person that maybe is, is instigating the conflict? What fear is this triggering in the person that's responding to the conflict? Um, because oftentimes that's what's happening. There is a fear, there is a need or a want and a fear of what will happen if that need or want isn't met that causes us to go into um a place where anxiety, again, plays a strong part and has hijacked sort of the, the family system. Um, in terms of, of our, our partner, it's important to remember that in order to, to change a family system, leadership is required. And obviously the adults in that system are the ones most suited to, to play those leadership roles. And you do wanna have a united front. You do wanna be on the same page. You wanna take time to talk to each other and check in with one another. And, and check in in a way that, that maybe you don't have an agenda. So a lot of times we check in when we're problem solving. You know, there's a problem, we need to talk, we need to figure it out, we need to get to the bottom of it. Um, and those things are important, but it's even more important to take time to simply check in with one another, like Jen said, and ask how the other person is feeling. Are they feeling depressed? Are they feeling anxious? You know, what, what, um, 
what sort of thoughts are they having about all this? What are their feelings? Um, and listen in a way that doesn't necessarily yield any answers, but allows the other person to know that you have truly paid attention to them, that their inner state matters to you um, and that you really want to know what is going on with them. Um, and that, that's something that you have to put away the distraction. So that's something that you can't do while you're on your phone or you can't do, you know, while you're, you're also trying to work from home. That's something that really should be carved out to just focus on the other person. Um, and you can also ask critical questions of your partner, like, uh, what do you need from me that would, would help you feel more cared for? You know, what could I do that would, would feel nurturing to you? What could I do um, that would allow you to be more vulnerable with me or, or share your thoughts and feelings with me? What would it look like if I were 5% more friendly to you or you were 5% more, more friendly to me? Um, and these are, these are, you know, not my ideas. These are strategies that we use um, to really help couples reconnect to kind of find that that tenderness and that that vulnerability that really is the lifeblood of any relationship. Um, so that that's important. And also the, the piece of bone family systems that talks about differentiation. So differentiation is a lifelong process and um, most people have acquired a, a certain degree of differentiation from their family members by the time they leave home. But we have to remember that kids are, are very much in, in this process and a lot of adults are too. So when we talk about emotional maturity, I think it's tempting to, to use that word in a shaming way, but actually we're all still evolving in terms of our emotional maturity. And um, it's it's more of a skill set of, of uh, emotional intelligence, observation, practicing compassion and kindness, um, regulating our emotions that we are constantly working at than it is some uh, destination that we arrive at. But with dif differentiation, we want to have a certain level of autonomy. We want to feel like I have control over my life. I can safely disagree with the people in my family. I can um, make decisions for myself, but at the same time, we want to feel a sense of togetherness and belonging with the other people in our family. And negotiating those two demands can be really, really tricky. Um, and it's normal to kind of vacillate between one or the other, to really kind of break out and say, no, I don't care what any of you think. I'm, I want to do what I want to do. And then, oh, no, I'm sorry I behave that way. I want to feel close with you again. Um, and to understand that 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 sweet spot in the middle is especially hard to find right now because ideally we are able to maintain a certain amount of emotional distance with one another. Um, and emotional distance and physical distance typically go hand in hand. And now all of that has been upended. So I have no idea how long I've spoken, but I would just- We have questions, Kelly, though. We've had questions that have been yes. called in during this. So that's wonderful. I love drop the rope. That is something that I should just put next to my computer all the time to drop the rope. But I'm gonna um, send it over to Julie because I know you had a few questions, Julie. Yes, I do. And I'm not sure um, who would like to field this one. The first one is a parent who's very concerned because their child is convinced that this parent is going to die. This parent happens to be someone who is in a frontline worker where not met, not the medical field, but does go to work every day. And the child is just petrified that the mom is going to die. Who would like to handle that one? Because I'm sure that's happening a lot. I bet. Who would like to take that? Do you yeah. want to go, Yeah, I mean, I think, Jen, you're, you're obviously, um, I think, perfectly suited to answer this, working with, with children all the time. But I would underscore the importance of, like you said, um, listening to, to the concerns, validating the concerns, you know, making reassurances where you can, but also acknowledging that there's a certain degree of uncertainty in the world that, that we have to accept. Um, I think... It's okay, like Jen said, not not to have all the answers, but to remember that that sense of connection just by listening and spending time together, physical touch, 
playing. Playfulness is so important. It reminds us that uh, we're still alive and, you know, we have life to live and we can celebrate that. And it's a real antidote to despair. Um, so really taking time to engage in those would be my recommendations. Yeah. Um, also, I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to touch on um, the idea too, that helping kids to understand what they can control so that their actions, how are they contributing in these moments? And it's so easy for them to be frustrated and sad and upset, especially if they see other kids playing or what the deal is of why they're, why they're forced to stay home or why they're choosing, but using it as an empowered tool that this is what they can control to help in the situation. How are, how are activities that they participate in helping the situation? Because there is this loss of control for everybody. And that fear is very validated and, and, are very valid in all of our children at all grade levels when sure. parents are going out of the home. Sure, and also the fact that uh, the lead on every single newscast is about the deaths, the, you know, how many deaths are occurring, whether it's in, in your state, your town, your, your country, or the world, and maybe limiting children from seeing that over and over again would be helpful too. Yeah. Would you agree? Very I much agree so. with that, Julie. I was posting oh. um, every day the stats, and then... I had some people reach out to me and said, this is really depressing. Yeah. What about the people that have recovered? So now we do have the stats on that. And I think that's a better way to look at it. That's a great idea. Oh, you're the first one that said that, Kathy. I love that idea. That's wonderful. Another question came in about um, the whole idea of we're, we're eating not as well. And we're, we're yeah. allowing ourselves to gain a little weight here and there. And maybe not exercise as much because it's comfort food that we want right now. Who can speak to how how dangerous that actually is because it does not help with our stress at all as a matter of fact it's it's quite the opposite who'd like to feel that one first um i'm facing it watching myself in this screen constantly <laughs> um and facing that battle at home there there are times that we do need comfort and and to allow yourself to that and find a balance much like we tell our you know our kids as they grow up to make healthy eating choices and find a balance. Right now there needs to be that balance. So, you know, having a treat or having a snack, if that's, if that's helpful to you in those moments, then I think within reason, go for that. But try to partner that with taking a walk or getting outside, um, making a goal to get fresh air into your day every day, even if it's for 10 minutes to kind of renew. Kelly? I would add that anxiety is, um, you know, a feeling of being out of control yeah. and it is really tempting to, to want to soothe ourselves with, um, with comfort food, with sugar, with, um, you know, even caffeine and alcohol, um, or junk TV or whatever it is. And, you know, we're all human, we're all doing the best we can. And, you you should indulge you should take good care of yourself and um sometimes that means yeah it, indulging a little bit in things that maybe aren't the best for you but we know that um doing something about anxiety so naming it understanding it and then making a plan um to to be proactive about it is the best way to reduce it and I'm sure, you know, you guys can can attest to this in your own lives. You know that when you are getting up and you're having a nutritious breakfast and you're exercising, they feel better. So the act of indulgence is kind of, it's a passive almost a, avoidance or a distraction away from the anxiety. And sometimes that's the best we can do. We have to think about, is this the best I can do right now? And if so, yeah, that's okay. You know, tomorrow's a new day. Um, maybe later in the day, you'll feel a little motivated and you can just go for a little walk and, and kind of get the ball rolling. So thinking of baby steps, being gentle with yourself and knowing that, um, making a plan to address the, address the anxiety in healthy ways will, will have more bang for your buck. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, the last I have a little tip. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to share my little tip because we've been feeling it here in the Lenatra household and we're a very competitive family. <laughs> so we have started a little competition. So we start with planks, push-ups, and squats, I think it is. And we have downstairs a little big 
board with our names and you check off when you do it. And that can help for a family that's a little competitive with a little game. Um, granted, you know, my daughter's a competitive athlete and has not been in the gym for the past six weeks. So it helps her as well. But just my little tip, I'm not trained professional, but I like our little tip. Okay, thank that's you. That's great. That's a great idea. Um, and there's one other subject that's came up and it was the subject of anger. Um, I remember back in 2014 when the Ebola uh, was happening on the other side of the world. And I remember thinking, well, it's never going to come over here because we won't allow that to happen. And when this did happen, and someone said, I think it was um, Kelly who said that this is the silent, you, you don't see this enemy, it's, it's an unseen enemy. People are angry that this happened. Parents are angry. Spouses are, are are angry. I mean, we're all angry because this should not have happened. How do you put the, How do you frame that uh, in in your life and put it into a context that you can live with and you can move forward with? And let's start that one with uh, with Kelly. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I think anger is something that we, as a culture, are um, still really grappling with understanding how to to experience it and express it in healthy ways. It's something that I deal with with clients all the time. There's a lot of shame, a lot of secrecy around anger. People don't want to admit that they have anger. Um, but actually anger is really healthy, you know, and in this situation, um, yeah, I, I think that that anger is totally understandable. I think in terms of tapping into a, a healthy way of, of acknowledging it, we want to remember that it's, anger is a form of suffering um, or is a, a dimension of it, and suffering wants to be acknowledged. So our, our pain, our, um, our intense feelings, they want to be seen, they want to be acknowledged. And so to recognize, okay, I'm feeling anger, I'm angry, or, you know, my partner is angry, and to kind of drop into a more body-based recognition of that, um, uh, to, to drop into a heart-centered way of looking at that. So instead of the, the rational piece of this shouldn't have happened because of X, Y, and Z, and this person should have done that, and that person should have done that, What's happening in your body right now? Like, how are you feeling? Because usually underneath anger, there is a tremendous sense of loss, hurt, fear, um, and it can be connected oftentimes to prior experiences of, of loss and fear. And so it might be that when we drop into the body and we, we come from a, a heart-centered place, that somebody says, you know, I feel really out of control. And this reminds me of when I was six years old and I lost my dad, mm -hmm. you know, it, and that can be a huge aha moment to say, okay, you know, and, and that curiosity is really what gives way to healing. That's, that's perfect, perfect advice. And Jennifer, for, for children, they, they are angry and yet, and then also mm -hmm. they might see their parents who might be angry. So how, how do the kids deal with that sense of anger? But the combination, Kelly did a beautiful job of, of explaining that. Like it's this culmination of a number of feelings that present itself as anger and what, what is behind it or what might be a triggering component that's coming out now in life and the anger coming from that. I don't have control over this. I don't, I don't have the answers. I don't have control in what's going on or that, that conflict that basic needs at, in homes are challenged. People are without work. People are worried about food, um, are going to increase the stress levels in a number of ways. And then what are students witness? So, so finding some options for grounding or, or, or coping, like coming back, taking a break, taking a deep breath, trying to communicate with each other and try to view that anger is not a negative. Anger is not this, this big bad thing that we shouldn't talk about, but addressing it much like what Kelly said and trying to get to the root of it. So as we can begin to understand it and take it apart a little bit. Excellent. Uh, Kathy Lenatra, are you in your position of state representative? I'm sure you hear from people all the time that are not happy with this, that, or the other thing. Um, can you talk about the anger that you're hearing? I would love to talk about the anger that I'm, I do. I, from the minute I get up, 
um, probably to about 10 o'clock at night, I'm fielding calls or emails or speaking with constituents. Um, and, and they are angry. They're angry that they've lost their job and it's taking so long to get their unemployment. Um, they're angry that there's people collecting unemployment while they're working and the people collecting unemployment and making more than they did when they were working. Um, so there's a lot of resentment along with that anger. And what I try to do is not take it all in and not take it personally and try to help them the best that they can, that I can, um, but to follow up with them too and to make sure they're doing okay. But I do feel hopelessness. That's what I feel from my constituents. They're angry, they're hopeless. Um, but then when their unemployment comes and it's retroactive, then you'll get the call like, thank you. Yeah. And they, you could just feel them with that big sigh of relief. Okay, it's gonna be okay. Sure. But while they're waiting for that and they're, I'm sure frightened as well, um, all those emotions do come through. Right. Plans that people are making um, for graduations, even though it's not going to be the same graduation, but little parties and parades and social distancing and, and things that people keep hopping forward and making plans. Hope springs eternal. For both of the guests today, how important is hope in all of this? Let's start with, uh, with Kelly. Yeah, I mean, hope is, is huge. I think in terms of developing resilience, maintaining a positive attitude, so remembering that anxiety and negativity are contagious. And by the same token, you know, so is positivity. So taking time to reflect on what you're grateful for, taking time to remind yourself that, you know, this is temporary, all things change. So this will continue to develop. It will continue to unfold and, and remaining hopeful um, that your efforts and the efforts of our community are going to be productive or going to be successful is really important to keeping that emotional energy up. Yeah, that's great. And um, Jennifer, you also said breathe, you know, take a beat, breathe. <laughs> so how do, how do we play that one in? I just think, and again, I'm hearing from so many families and so many other clinicians and providers working with families. Um, I live with another educator, so I'm hearing it from his students as well, that everybody is on overload. You open up your email and it's now just a million emails from various teachers, from not just the teachers, but the coaches, the specialists, the schools, the principals. And just on site, it's just a lot to take in sure. and, and people are having a physical reaction before they even open and look at any of that. And so to be able to pause and give yourself permission to pause and say, I can only take in what I can take in right now and, and piece away at it in ways that work for you. That's kind of my message. Like you don't, there's no expectation to know it all and create a master schedule that works for your family. Um, that, that has all the stickers and the color codes and everything because we are changing and we need to figure out what works for us. And sometimes to do that, we need to allow ourselves to take that break and to take a deep breath and say, okay, I'm doing a great job. And, and, and I'm gonna start to gradually add more in. That's good advice. And Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you. And I love what you said about how your family's handling this with doing the little competition. I mean, every family will do it in a different way, but if it works for your family, that's wonderful. And I have no more questions today from, from our public, so I'll turn any other questions back to you. Oh, great. So just to both of you, if you do feel that your child needs some help, um, you do feel they're withdrawing and they're not eating as well, or they're not interested in things they used to be, like going on to a Zoom with their friends and their peers, who should you reach out to? Should you reach out to your primary care? I think that's a combination, if it's okay that I jump in. I think it's a combination in where you're comfortable. So much like we tell our children to reach out to the trusted adults who they are comfortable with going to. So if you're seeking advice at that level, and you're most comfortable with your relationship with a pediatrician, then start there, sound that out, or see if they have referrals to clinical providers. If you're comfortable reaching out to the school, as counselors, we are all accessible, we are all available, and we know your students. So we can help with some of that discussion too. Um, what, what might be a change, or what's something that we might have noticed, or why they're concerned, and help with those community referrals too or help and see if there's an opportunity for us to provide some services um, 
one-on-one -on -one with the students from home or in virtual ways. Great, thank you. Thank you both so much for joining me today. You answered so many questions and there's so many great tips that we can help navigate through the rest of this, hopefully through May 18th. I know there's a lot of parents out there that are working from home and trying to homeschool, which is not easy. And then there's also just one parent at home and someone else is still working. So it all is on one parent. So before I go one more time, Kelly, question for you. So if you're a parent that's home, you're working from home and taking your children, but your spouse or your partner is working away from home, is there some way, I'm hearing some, from some of my friends, that they're starting to feel resentful to their partner? Is there a way to deal with that? Yeah, I think that that's normal too, right? Anytime someone gets to leave the house, it's it's kind of like, oh, have fun out there. <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think it's normal to feel resentful and to understand though that that person leaving the house is faced with a whole different set of, of concerns, you know, in terms of protecting themselves and, and protecting the household. So being really careful, I think, to, to be mindful of your words and actions and just because you're experiencing a moment of anxiety or resentment, not to um, pass that along to everyone else in the family to take time to check in and think about what are some ways that you could get some of those needs met for, for yourself. You know, maybe you need time away from the kids, away from the house to, to just go for, you know, a walk safely, you know, socially distancing. Um, but what are there ways that, that your partner can support you? Because obviously the resentment is a red flag that, um, you know, your, your, a need is not being met. Great. Thank you. Well, this has been wonderful. I'm so excited we were able to start these series. Next week, we'll be talking about grief. We'll have a grief counselor. We'll have someone, um, Denise Brack from Hope Floats and a grief counselor and a nurse that works in the ICU. So I think that will be very beneficial to a lot of us that have lost loved ones or have that fear of losing loved ones. Um, but thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Having me. And thank you, Kathleen. This is this is just terrific. Last week was wonderful. This week also, and all the all the um, information and resources that Kathy brings to us in these forums are available on her website, and it's kathylenatra.com. Um, this can be replayed by going to pactv.org slash regional because we consider this a regional forum. It's good for everybody. It's not just for one town. It's for anybody who, who, who can benefit from it and everyone probably can. We also put the date on the, on the screen, the date that we film these because in a lot of cases, information changes and situations change. So the information that you're getting is as of today's date. So thank you so much for joining us, Kathy. Thank you for having this. It's, it's really good to just be reminded about how our mental health is so important and to be aware and to be cognizant of how we feel and how we're reacting and how we're acting. So please social distance, try to stay positive, take a breath, and we will see you next Friday at 1.30 for another Kathy Lenatra special. Thank you. and it really made a difference. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I know. I can't, and that's the thing. I'm like, I didn't say anything about meditation. That's like a huge part of what I do. You know? I don't know. But we touched on everything. Of it is but there's so much pressure coming at us to get it all right. It's, you just have to pause and take it in shock. There's no way to...